So um, now to um, move on with what you're actually here, besides the lunch, what else you're here for, and that's to hear our speakers. So I'm going to ask them to come up in the order um, that they're going to speak. Um, so if Tony would come up, Tony Buedo, he's an Iraq and Afghanistan veteran. He also owns TNT Tent and Table and Freedom Movers. He's from Agawam. Um, I supposed to stand there. Oh, no, you can sit. Part. You can sit, yeah. <laughs> You're going to be standing in just a minute. All righty. Um, uh, Mr. Bill Burns, a Vietnam veteran. <laughs> Bill is from Bondsville, and he's been a community veteran uh, advocate for, well, since he left. Vietnam. Um, Dr. Kelly Cox. <laughs> Kelly is from the uh, Vet Center. She's an Iraq War vet, now residing in Belchertown in a nice, beautiful house. Can't wait till the pool is operational. <laughs> um, a couple of dear friends, uh, Mr. Jerry Clark, Vietnam. Jerry's a Vietnam vet. He's now the veteran service officer over in Hatfield, and um, I've known him for a number of years. I used to live next to his mother. You don't park in her spot, I'm just telling you. And uh, another good friend, Mr. Tom Pease, Vietnam. Jerry and Tom are actually going to kind of stand up together because they kind of grew up together. So it'll be fascinating to hear from them. And um, last but definitely not least, um, I'm going to call on um, Ed, quote, Red Morrissey, World War II veteran. We're making sure that uh, the city website is live streaming this as well, so all of those um, other retired Northampton policemen can listen to Ed live. Uh, it'll also be recorded, so it's a great thank you to Northampton Community Television for um, providing the streaming for us. Uh, otherwise, we were going to use my iPhone, and you know, it's good, but it's only an iPhone 8, so this is going to be awesome. So with, um, with that all said, I'm going to um, ask Tony Boydo, please give him your undivided attention as he's going to do a, a, I'm sorry, did I say it wrong? No. Oh, no. I thought I mispronounced it, but it's what I'm known to do. Um, so um, yeah, so please come up. All right, thank you. Thank you. I'm only 5'7 here, this is a little tall. <laughs> well, thank you guys for having me here today. I definitely appreciate it. Um, wasn't really thrilled about going first, but I really don't want to follow up after these guys. I have some amazing men and women behind me. Um, my name is Anthony Boydo. I served um, in the United States Air Force Reserve uh, from 2008 to 2014. Uh, in this time, I did three deployments. I went to uh, Iraq uh, and Afghanistan twice. Uh, the first deployment came in 2009, just a year after uh, joining. I uh, went to Afghanistan for my first tour. Um, came back from that, uh, went for uh, six months. Uh, second tour was 2011. I uh, went to Iraq. Uh, we closed it down. And then sh less than a year later, went back to Afghanistan for my third and final tour. Um, they all... They all uh, are a part of me. Uh, it's definitely uh, the si best six years of my life. Um, I'll always remember them. Uh, the last tour I went on, um, it was definitely the most defining. Uh, 13 days after I got there, my son was born. Uh, I got the whole uh, watch it on the computer. And um, about 10 days after that, for the first time in three deployments, a uh, little, little tra tragic accident, a uh, rocket hit the building I was in, uh, just 40 feet away. And it was really a pivotal moment of uh, my life. It sat there, it made me think, wow, 40 feet away. What if I was uh, 40 feet closer? Uh, what if I didn't get home to see my son for the first time? I never even met him. So there's a lot to go going through my mind, but it was 
literally some of the best years, and I met some of the best men and women of my life. And I think everybody that's a veteran will, uh, will tell you that. Um, 2012, when I got home from my last tour, I, um, I uh, was transitioning back to my civilian life. I, I was in the reserve, so I had a full-time job. I worked for the town of Aguam, and um, at that same time, I was uh, starting a small company. Uh, it's called TNT Tent and Table Rentals. It's, uh, I started with two used tents back in 2012. Um, and as, as I got older, as it grew, I really didn't plan on it growing to um, the size and the magnitude that it has. Um, but a lot of it really has to do with my military background. Um, making that jump. Uh, everyone has to make that jump to sign the papers to join the military. Everyone has to make that jump when uh, they go overseas. And for me, making the jump to start a business was the same type of feeling. It was, uh, it was an easy one. It was a scary one, but it was, uh, but it was one that I had done. So as, uh, as my company grew, um, it was as the time I was getting out of the military. Um, and in six years later, uh, the company now that went from just two lone tents is now 30 plus tents, seven guys working, um, tables, chairs, dance floors. We do staging, we do weddings, we do, we do some very, very large events. It's amazing to see how it's grown. Um, but I really thank the military for giving me that push, for giving me that uh, bravery and uh, to get, get it done. Um, being able to serve my country was one of the greatest feelings of the world. Um, knowing that I was serving my people and my, my friends, my family, my, my home. And uh, getting out of the military, it's, it's kind of tough because I, that's all going to be uh, going away. I'm not going to be able to do that anymore. Um, but within my company, I've been able to help the people. I told myself, hey, if you're not going to be in the military, you have to still help the people and help them when you can, where you can. Um, with that being said, I've been able to use my company as a foundation to help people. Um, we make yearly, from the very first year I started, uh, we've, we were making donations to Shriners Hospital for Children. Um, it started off as a $300 donation. It, it made me feel like I was on top of the world. It was great. Um, and as I've grown, as the company's grown, the donations have been able to be bigger. They've been able to, I've been able to help people more. I've been able to reach people more. Um, the American Cancer Society, the Relay for Life, we've given thousands to them. Um, vet organizations, there's tons of them out there. And every single one that I'm able to work with I work very closely with, and I've always been able to give back, and it's been some of the greatest feelings of the world. Um, for the people that are coming back that do have a tough time, they have to realize, you guys, you veterans, you guys are heroes. Uh, the biggest transition of your life was, was leaving home and going overseas to a co uh, country that you may not know nothing about. You've never been there. You don't know, you don't know where you are. You don't know who, who you're going to be with. That's one of the toughest transitions. Coming home, you're a hero, and you got to realize you're tough. You're tough, and you can get it done here. And uh, I honestly thank the military and for everything that it's given to me. And I really, really love being able to help out, even though I'm not in it anymore. So thank you guys for having me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, now I would call on Bill Burns, please. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Billy Burns, and I'm from Palmer. I lived in Palmer just about all my life. Actually, it's uh, Bondsville for uh, those people that never heard of it, but uh, I've lived there for 42 years, and uh, I joined the United States Army in 1965, and I got out in 1969. I served two years in Germany, and then I volunteered for Vietnam, and I served with the 9th Infantry Division as a combat medic, which uh, I learned a lot of lessons serving as a, as a, a combat infantry medic, and uh, which carried me through the rest of my life. I got out in October of 69, and I got married in April of 70, and I'll be married 48 years this year, so uh, I'm, 
I'm very, very proud of that. And uh, shortly after I get out of the service, so I, uh, I raised three daughters and uh, heavily involved with them with little girls softball. I coached like 13 years for the girls. And I always kept an eye on the community as far as veterans and the VA, try to steer them in the right direction to go get help if needed, especially at that critical time in our country when it wasn't fashionable to be a Vietnam veteran. And uh, anyone that I encounter now, Vietnam veteran, Iraq, Afghanistan, I try to pull them in and tell them the help is out there. The veteran, the VA is a wonderful organization to get involved. Join the American Legions, join the AMVETS, get involved in your community and help them out the best you can, in, uh, which will reflect on a better family life if some of these guys are just hiding under a bridge someplace. Uh, and um, I uh, was instrumental in getting the, the town of Palmer named the Purple Heart Town, along with our fine veterans agent, Troy Brin. Along with him, with his help, we got the town of Palmer just recently named that. And I, I organized an event three years ago to uh, welcome home Vietnam Veterans Day, which was nine, March 29th. Um, every year it's, it's celebrated by Congress and we got Palmer to hold a ceremony and read a proclamation every year to keep our Vietnam veterans in focus. And uh, like I said, I, I, I keep my eye out for veterans that recently discharged. I keep in touch with the veterans agents, the, the commanders of the various organizations to get these veterans helps that are out, get them help that are they were struggling out there along with their families, which is a very tough time now with uh, the all volunteer services and stuff like that. And these, uh, these repeated uh, duty assignments to Afghanistan and Iraq and two and three is way too much. It's, it's too much stress on these young people. It's really tough when they come home to adjust. This is why I, as many as I can get a hold of, I'll keep an eye on them and uh, draw them in to get the help and uh, try to get as active as you can in, in the community, which will help them, as I said, and their families. And uh, it, it helps the community, too. And uh, people take a, a fine eye on, on the veterans. They're not all you know, in really tough shape, but there is a lot of them out there still, and the, the suicide rate is like 20, 22, 28 guys a day, and this is something we have to correct through uh, the VA education, community support, family support, and uh, it's just something that, uh, it's a problem that has, it's being worked on now, and, and they're struggling, but I think these repeated assignments have a lot to do with it for these younger guys and women that serve in uh, these, these countries. But uh, like I said, I've been married all these years and nice wife, three kids, five grandchildren, one great grandson who was born on my birthday two and a half years ago. So that was really good. And uh, you have to have trust in what you're doing to take the step forward. You have to, it has to start with you. You, you go for help, you'll find a lot of help out there to each and every one of you. So it's, it's really important to uh, focus on uh, the help of these veterans. So I thank you again for coming, and uh, God bless you all. Thank you, Bill. Uh, just to echo... Um, just a moment of what he just said. We're, we're speaking about a, a veteran who has now spent most of his career helping other veterans and helping to serve in the community, which is exactly why we're doing this Storyteller X. Again, this is the first one in New England. Uh, we're hoping to have it all over New England and across Massachusetts because these gentlemen here, the gentlemen out here having lunch every week, they're your neighbors, they served, they came back, we just want to notice that not everyone's a hero, not everyone's broken, but we all served, and we want to just 
make sure that the community knows we're here. So very good so far. Two down. We got four to go. Um, I'm now going to introduce uh, Dr. Kelly Cox, an Iraq War veteran, and also um, works at the Springfield Vet Center. Kelly? So I'm Kelly. Thank you for listening to me today. Um, I'll share a little bit about my story and then what I'm doing currently. I joined the Army when I was 19 years old, um, really because I was going through a tumultuous time in my life, and I needed structure, and I needed direction. And, you know, the Army definitely has those and gives them to you freely. So um, I started off in petroleum supply, uh, surprisingly, and um, then thankfully recruited into the JAG Corps doing some paralegal work. Uh, in about 2007, I volunteered to deploy with the 18th Airborne Corps. Um, we went to Baghdad, Iraq for 12 months. Uh, the majority of my job was working in a division where I tracked um, investigations. And the largest part of that was really called the death tracker. I would go in um, and it would talk about what happened that day or the day before um, with any U.S. soldier in the entire country. Uh, so I was tasked with making sure those investigations took place appropriately and working with casualty and mortuary affairs. Um, and throughout my time there, I worked on 160 um, death cases of American soldiers, really just making sure that they were done in an honorable way, that they were done right, and that the families got the information they needed on their lost loved ones. So when I returned, um, it really was a 48-hour transition, if that. One day I was in Baghdad, the next day I was um, in Columbus, Ohio, bartending and serving pasta. So I started to have a little bit of trouble there. I was uh, not sleeping at night and sleeping all day, um, depressed, drinking too much, and... Um, kind of didn't know where I was going or what happened next. So thankfully, uh, through the GI Bill and uh, motivation of important people in my life, I got accepted into a master's program in Washington, D.C., and started my graduate education there. Um, I wanted to move on to my doctorate, and I had a professor I really looked up to. She had worked in the VA, um, and I knew, you know, she would be my ticket into this doctoral program. But when I sat down with her, she told me, I don't think you have it, Kelly. You're, you're not going to make it. I can't support you in moving forward. Um, and so I guess I could have quit, but instead I got angry and motivated and said, I'm going to show you. And uh, I remember walking across the stage when I graduated with my doctorate. And I looked over and said, hi, Linda. <laughs> and that felt really good. But what felt even better is that um, I wrote a dissertation on military reintegration. And I was able to carry that out into a career. Um, I did some of my doctoral training up at the VA in Northampton, working with the Word 8 program, working in substance use, and um, was so inspired and just knew I was in the right place. I knew that I was with my people and that this is how I could create meaning out of every, not only with what I went through, but with everybody and their stories. So learning about the vet center and the heart of it being reintegration, I started knocking on doors and saying, please hire me. <laughs> and after a while, they did. I wore them down. And I'm so glad because I'm very fortunate to have my dream job um, working with veterans every single day, um, not only doing therapy traditionally, which is incredibly important, but really with the hallmark of it all is connection with each other. It's understanding that we're all in this together. You don't have to go through it alone. And um, I've found that that's what really promotes healing. And even when people are having a hard time, when I recognize you know, that spark in someone's eyes, that smile across someone's face, and I feel like I'm doing it, I'm giving back, and this is why I keep you know, showing up every day and waking up every day. And I'm just so grateful to have that opportunity and 
you know, to hear some of the veterans tell me that I have impacted their life, it just makes it so worth it. And I'm very, very grateful to continue in that. I've also become involved in um, an outreach project, the Western Mass Veterans Outreach Project, where we're going around to um, community providers, providing military cultural awareness, and um, we want the community to come together, civilian and veterans, allies, everyone. And so hopefully we can continue our work there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. That was awesome. I, I serve on that committee with her, um, and it was all brought together by a gentleman, Larry. I can't see because the light's in my way. But, oh, there's Larry, um, uh, who brought us together. And we are, we're working with uh, health providers across Western Massachusetts, because when it comes time to get things that we need, Western Massachusetts, we go and get it. We stop waiting for everybody else. One more quick shout out. I, you know, we're still talking about having community and getting veterans so that they're not by themselves. This lunch, the reason we started it was so veterans could get together and they're not alone and they're not feeling isolated. And we started it here first in uh, the first one. It now happens every week up in Greenfield as well. It happens once a month up in Florence at the VFW up there. It happens in West Springfield once a month. It happens every week in Hoyoke as well. And there's thoughts that this is working so well that we might be looking to bring it statewide. So uh, I'm working with Chris and everybody else to see about doing that. Thanks. Eddie, do we still have some food? Anybody still looking for seconds or haven't had anything yet? Please feel free. Um, now I'm going to call on two people to step up at the same time. Um, nope, nope. They'd rather go one at a time. That's fine. Actually, now that you say that, there's not a lot of room for you to stand next to each other. Well, yes, right. That's what I get for coming up with ideas. So um, first, I'd like to invite uh, Jerry Clark, um, who I've known for a long time, to come up and give us a little brief uh, account of his story. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, my name is Jerry Clark, and uh, I was brought up in Northampton, lived in Northampton my whole life, just up the street, actually. Um, my quick story was that I probably was one of the people that fell into the draft. Uh, I was fortunate to start to work for the phone company, and after six months, uh, I got a letter from the president and said, welcome, greetings. So uh, I uh, got drafted and uh, spent two years um, in the Army. I was with the... Uh, I did basic training and advanced infantry training at um, Fort Dix, New Jersey. We then uh, went to uh, Fort Riley, Kansas, where they were actually activating the 9th Infantry Division um, to go to Vietnam as an entire division. Um, we spent the uh, summer of uh, that year, 1996, 1966, hello. Um, but anyhow, uh, we went over as a complete unit. Uh, we got on a train, the entire unit, vehicles, everything, and uh, for Fort Riley, which is halfway across the country. Uh, by train, we went to uh, San Francisco. They backed the train up next to a ship, and uh, we filed off of the train onto the ship, and for 21 days, um, we were on our way to Vietnam. The actual uh, tour of duty counted the minute we went under the uh, San Francisco Bridge. We were hoping the ship would break down, whatever. We didn't care how long it took us. But um, one, of the, one of the things about the, uh, our service was the fact that we were all went at the same time. And what they did about six months into our tour, they uh, split us up. They took uh, a lot of people from the 9th and transferred them to other units. Um, I was fortunate to stay with my unit. Um, but what it did was you knew the people that you were with, especially being in an infantry uh, unit. You knew who you could count on. You knew who the person you couldn't count on. 
um, when they started rotating the people in, you got new people and you didn't trust them. And that trust, you didn't want to know them. You didn't want to be any part of them. Um, the, the downside of that was when someone got killed or wounded that you had been with back all the way back to Fort Riley, it really meant uh, you were hurt a lot. So nobody wanted that hurt again. So if you ever hear a Vietnam veteran talking about, I didn't want to be close to anybody, that's part of the reason. Um, I won't get into that. Um, one of the things when uh, I came back from Vietnam, I said, geez, I want to help the veterans, especially our World War II and Korean veterans. And, uh, you know, and I said, geez, I want to join the organization. And I went to uh, the organization and I said, geez, I'm here. I'd like to uh, join your organization. I just came back from Vietnam and the gentleman and I talked for about five or six minutes and he goes, kid, you don't know what war's like. I go, oh, really? I said, you know, well, then apparently your opinion is probably not an organization that I want to belong to. And I, you know, left and belonged to a different organization, and I just got my 50-year 50 50 year pin for uh, being a member of the Hatfield American Legion um, last week. So I, I th I think the uh, just that, that story just sticks in my mind that uh, you know back then people just didn't want to know anything about the Vietnam veteran. It's just yeah, go go about your own way, and it was so easy to just tuck yourself in and forget about it and get back to work for the phone company or whatever. Um, since I've uh, been involved the last three years. I have been the uh, veteran service officer in the town of Hatfield. And it's a very rewarding job, anybody who is one. Uh, we're very fortunate that uh, we have a veteran service officer in every single 351 towns and cities, of, I think it is. So if anybody's got a problem, feel free to make that phone call to the VSO and that person will be able to help you in, in one way or another, either refer you or um, th to help you get the paperwork that needs to be done. Um, in the small town of Hatfield, uh, we have some people that uh, go for, that are on chapter 115 that go month to month. When they, that check doesn't come a week late because of a holiday or whatever, they're actually borrowing money from their daughter or their son so that they can buy the food to get through the month. So those benefits that are out there are really very important. Um, I've been, I'm gonna end here, um, been, uh, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let it go at that. One of the things I do wanna say is that being a Vietnam veteran, I've always said and been advocating the VA. The VA is there. You've got to go to the VA. And I never did it myself. I always thought, that's not for me. That's for the World War II vet. That's for the Korean vet. It's not for me. Um, with the people coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, that's for them. You guys got to go to the VA. It's not for me. Well, I'm at that age and I'm looking out at some Vietnam veterans here, and guess what? It's our turn. It's our turn to go to the VA, enroll in the healthcare system, get the benefits that you're entitled to, don't wait. It's not their turn, it's our turn. And I'll leave it at that, thank you. Really good job, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to do a, he didn't say it, um, but I want to brag. He, um, for several years, was the president of our Veterans Council that does parades and ceremonies in our community. And what was awesome is he took over and changed my life because my office was doing everything. And he reactivated that group that they make so many of the decisions 
they meet all year long, and it's a big piece that's off of my plate. And he um, was responsible for really taking hold of that, so I greatly appreciate Jerry. Um, the, uh, it's also, uh, just want to let folks know that Valley Eye Radio is also recording this, so you'll be able to go onto their website and also get a, um, a verbal recording of this. Is that what I want to say, verbal? Yeah. Uh, audio recording, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, another member of the Veterans Council of Northampton um, who came on with a great idea at one point and he put it off. I'll, if he wants to talk about it, I'll let him. Otherwise, I'll tell you. Um, is um, Mr. Tom Pease, Vietnam veteran, and uh, also grew up here. And the reason I had asked about him and Jerry, because they kind of grew up together, but they got their own story. So I'll ask uh, Tom to please come up. Good afternoon. My name is Tom Pease. I live at uh, 130 Spring Street in Florence. Um, I uh, am also the commander at the VFW Post 8006 in Florence. Also the founder and now the consultant for 1812 Paint & Body. We're going into our 35th year and my sons now own the business and I work for them. But my story is about survival and perseverance. Uh, I'm a 1965 graduate of Smith Vocational High School along with my good friend Jerry. Um, 1967, I was drafted and uh, came as no surprise. A lot of us knew that we were going. I uh, did my basic training and advanced individual training in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, AIT. They told me it was advanced individual tra training. No, it was advanced infantry training. So lo and behold, I went to Vietnam in um, August, or oh, late August, early September 1967, and got into country, got my orders, and I was going to the 1st Cavalry Division, Air Mobile. I said, helicopters, great, I won't have to hump the boonies too much. Well, I did. Also, I was assigned to the 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry. If anybody knows about the 7th Cav, that's uh, General Custer's last stand. And I said, this is not looking good. But I got into my unit, uh, into my platoon, and they, we were rotating in. We were re replacements for, if any of you are familiar with the Idrang Valley, the, uh, the uh, incidents that happened there in late 1965, we were some of the replacements for that unit, the 2nd Battalion, 7th Cavalry, the 1st Battalion, 7th Cavalry. So when I got my unit, I had three choices. I could be a radio man, I could be an assistant gunner, carry all the ammo, or I could walk point. I walked point for six months, saw my share, saw the good, saw the bad. I, got, I received very good training in, in on K. That's our base camp for the first cab. I was taught how to look for booby traps, how to look for punji stakes, uh, hidden, a lot of things hidden. I got some very good training there. To, that helped me a lot. I'll give you two quick points, uh, two quick incidents that happened to me that made me realize about survival and perseverance. One was I was walking point for the entire platoon coming off a mountain and we had run in, I smelled smoke, and we had run into a platoon size little feast, I guess, because the rice was still hot in the pots. It was still steaming. There was uh, gear all over the ground. I was the first one on the scene. And I said to myself, I survived this. I could have ran into you know, a whole platoon being in front of my platoon. The other thing was on the 78th day, I uh, was an elite helicopter with our battalion uh, sergeant major, and uh, we went into uh, Quezon to relieve the Marines. And uh, flying in there, I saw what the North Vietnamese were doing, what they did to the runways, to all the equipment there. I saw the uh, trenches that they dug up through the concertina wire. I saw the Marines. And again, I thought to myself, I'm surviving this. And I'm persevering. I'm pushing forward. So what I learned through the military is a lot about survival, about, you know, I, I came home. I, you know, I obviously I didn't get killed in Vietnam. I, I've survived. Uh, there's got to be, there's got to be more to it. All along, I always wanted to start my own business. When I came back from Vietnam, I turned my back on the military. I grew my hair down on my shoulders. I wanted nothing. I, 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 I'd had enough. I'd seen enough. I moved to Florida. I started a family in Florida with my wife, Peg. 
again, I wanted nothing to do with the military. And what happened was 9-11 came along. It shook me up. And I'm sure it shook a lot of us up. It changed me and changed my way of thinking. And I got to think, and I says, you know, I survived. I'm a survivor. So we went into, I went into business. I was in business at the time, actually. And what made, what's making our business successful is, was my willingness to survive, to persevere, to think back to the military, think back to all those times that it was so tough, but I kept going. I kept going. I kept going. And I instilled that into my sons. And for 35 years, that's what I've done. Every day I've gotten up and put the left foot in front of the right foot. Survive. Survive. Uh, we all can do it. You have to, you have to, you have, to have that mindset. I, uh, 1991, I lost a son. And uh, I dug deep. And I thought about basic training, and I thought about AIT, and I thought about Vietnam. I said, I got to keep going. Get up in the morning and put your left foot in front of your right foot. Continue. We can do it. We can all do it. Um, that being said, along with Jerry, I didn't really want to go to the VA. I had no reason to go to the VA. Well, I've been up to the VA a few times. I've got some benefits now. Uh, I've got some health issues. They're taking care of everything. I always thought that, boy, the waiting list is going to be like six months. I'm going to have to wait a year to get up there. My God, I went up there for hearing aids, and like two days later, here I am. I can hear again. So, yeah, the benefits are out there. But uh, getting back to survival and perseverance, just put the left foot in front of the right foot. Keep going. You'll make it. Thank you. Oh wow! This is this is better than I expected. This is great. Um, of course, I left my sheet over there, but I'll have to wing it. Uh, the one thing I wanted to um, do a call out for is also um, Jerry was talking about when he came back and he tried to join a club. Uh, the ironic thing is, is at least for me, uh, being um, you know at a younger age. This place was originally called the World War II Club. It's the uh, World War II Veterans Association. And you go, well, why wasn't it just a VFW and American Legion? Well, what happened was a bunch of city uh, World War II vets came home, and they wanted to uh, join one of the other associations. And they were saying, oh, you weren't in a real war. So they started a club for World War II veterans. So uh, I guess it's gone through our history. I'm not quite sure who they let talk to other veterans when they say, oh, I was in the real war, yours wasn't. But just the idea that they had to start a World War II club for World War II veterans because theirs wasn't a real war. Okay. Um, and with that in mind, uh, our, our um, final speaker of the day is um, Ed Morrissey. Uh, his nickname was Red. Um, he is a World War II veteran. He was also a career uh, police officer with the Northampton Police Department, so I know they're going to want this link and, and show it to all the folks there. Um, Ed, would you come up? I'm going to read a little something first, and then we'll hand the spotlight over here. Good afternoon, my name is Ed Morrissey, and I appreciate this opportunity to speak with my fellow veterans about my experiences during and after serving our country. I'll begin by telling you that I was a student at Smith School who got up at 5.30 each morning to milk the cows at Warner Farm, then went to school and after school worked at Breguet's gas station in the center of Florence, pumping gas and washing cars in an era when that was done by hand. <laughs> While working there, World War II broke out, but I was too young to join up. I also spent a lot of time hanging around the fire station in Florence and watched the men there cutting up and cooking chicken. I learned how to do it, and this would come in handy in my service career. 
I joined the Navy on May 5th, 1942, and attended Cook and Baker School in Norton Heights, Connecticut. I eventually became a petty officer, first class, and served as the ship cook. I learned firsthand that a military force is at its best when it eats well, and I always tried to make certain the folks I was responsible for were well fed. I carried away the importance of working well with others and serving others. In my military career, I learned the importance of serving our country and protecting it from harm. Those lessons would come in very handy in my post-military career. My service career ended on January 1st, 1946, and I returned to Florence. I decided to take some time off after military service because I did not want to go right to work. But I soon had a job at Brookside Dairy peddling milk on four routes. I was earning all of $35 a week, but that wasn't enough, so I left for a job glazing knives at International Silver. As you can see, I was never really without work, as I had to support myself and was always looking for a better position. A friend of mine, John McCullough, was a Northampton police officer who worked at the Market Street Beat in town. In 1951, he told me the police department was looking for six new hires, and I applied and became one of the six joining the force in 1951. So after defending our country in the military, I was now charged with defending our city and its residents. I took the beat walking on Market Street for two years, and while I was on the force, I walked every beat in the city and drove every route there was in a cruiser. Besides that, I took care of the city's parking meters. Fixing them was expensive and time consuming as they had to be sent to New Jersey for repair if they broke. I learned to fix them and ended up saving the city a lot of money on parking meter repairs. During my 25 years on the force, I learned a lot as a police officer. It was a good job, I liked people, and I did not want to see people get hurt. Sometimes you had to do things that make sure people didn't get hurt. Some people needed help and you would consider that as you decided what charges to file against them. You learned that a lesser charge would be appropriate in some cases, so the person learned he had made a mistake but wouldn't suffer a serious loss of a career or personal relationship because he, he could earn his way back from the mistake. But after my military service, I didn't forget my fellow veterans. I wanted to be sure I was available to do good for the men and women who, I serve, who served like I did. I'm a past commander of the American Legion in Hadley and was active in the Florence VFW Post 8006. I not only did a lot of work on their building, but also attended two Massachusetts conventions. Giving back to those who served was important to me. All of us have given our, of our time, effort, and energy in defending our country. But we veterans do more than that. When we return from service, we take positions and do work that helps to enhance our neighborhoods, state, and country. I am proud to be among you and glad I was able to share some thoughts with you today. Thank you very much. I'll just give you a little brief of where I went in the service. I left here in May of 1942, and then I went down to Springfield and out to Newport, Rhode Island. From Newport, Rhode Island, I went to New Roten Heights, Connecticut, and went to Cook and Baker School for three months. After I left the Cook and Baker School, I went down to Bainbridge, Maryland, where they're building a new uh, place for uh, inductees to come in. There was only one building there. When I left there, there was enough buildings to hold 80 guys coming into the service from the south and out west. I left there and went over to Pennsylvania, and that's where they were making the ships, LSTs. Probably a lot of people don't know what they are, but they were a landing ship where they could glide up to the, gr up to the ground almost and drive out of the front with heavy equipment. So I worked on that, and we went down the, uh, the uh, river into uh, Florida, 
and from Florida I went to the West Coast, and from there I went out to Hawaii, and then I went from there out to Okinawa, Taipan, Japan, and uh, the other islands there, and we were in the invasion of the Palu Islands. I fed 60, 160 Marines steak and eggs at five o'clock in the morning, and they had a landing going, and they started in from with the smaller boats to the shore, and somebody had goofed. There was a reef there, and they couldn't get in only about 80 feet from the shore. So the guys all jumped out of the ship, or the small boats, and swam in. When they swam in, the Japs were in the bushes behind them, and them 160 guys were dead by 9 o'clock in the morning. And I never, I never forgot that, not one day. And I'll tell you, that just them two or three weeks, the first time we were there, they shot over uh, 20,000 of our men. And then they shot, kept going and going, but it was always a shootout every day. And that's where I ended up. Then we got into a bad storm one time, <clears throat> excuse me, and we got broached with our ship to back in, got up on land, and it bent the, the uh, screws that ran the ship. So we were sitting there and sitting there, and they were getting ready to go to the Philippines then. There was 500 ships in that area, and they all left to go to the Philippines, and we were sitting there. We couldn't get off. So we went. We had a commander come on, and he looked, and he says, well, they're going to tow it back to Hawaii, and that's where we went. And finally they fixed it, and we went back out. And I stayed around Saipan and Guam and Tinian for about four months, and then I came home on a transport ship in 1946. And I've been been here ever since. I'm 100 and, uh, 100 and ninety six years old. Last month. <laughs> well, well, thank everybody that came. It was great pleasure for me to be here. Again, these are your neighbors. Um, we're lucky Ed comes every week to the lunch, and we're blessed to have him every year, uh, every week. Um, that's how you can get up in age real fast, turn weeks into years. Um, the one other thing I wanted to note when I thought of uh, as, as Ed was speaking is uh, Tommy was right. He, he went through a change about what it was to be a veteran. And, one of the things he did is he came up to Jerry, who was head of the Veterans um, Council of Northampton, and he came with an idea. And his idea was, how about if we get all the World War II veterans that went in from Northampton and take them down to the War Memorial down in Washington, D.C.? And he brought that idea, and everybody thought it was a great idea. Not so. At first. Not at first. Well, but, it, but, it, but we all, you won us over. For sure. And what ended up happening is, is we ended up with two chartered bus. They went down to Washington, D.C. Uh, I was invited to go. I wanted to go, but I had won tickets to go to Greece and Turkey, and it was eh. So I went to Greece and Turkey. Sorry, guys. Um, but from that experience, they went down. They spent nights over at a place, a hotel. Everybody was great. I, I wasn't there, so I can't say much, except that I know when they went down, they talked about how people were talking and kind of getting to know each other. And on the way back, the Northampton police met them at the line, brought them all the way back up to the Elks where their cars or people were going to be there to pick them up, and they were all singing. Oh, yeah. So they had found camaraderie in that thing. That's what this is about, folks. This is what it's about. Get to know the people that are in your neighborhood. They're probably veterans. It's great to say thank you for your service, but ask a little bit more. Ask them to tell you a story, because, boy, there's rich stories out here. Um, as they did go down and had that great trip, um, that was a one-shot deal. It was a lot of work and a lot of effort. But uh, 
now we have somebody who does all that work, and he's been doing it for a while. I shouldn't say now, but Steve, one sidebar I want to put in there. Oh, okay. The community, we Step up. Out, we uh, reached out to the community because this was an all-expense-paid trip. It was uh, four and five, five days and four nights. World War II Memorial, Vietnam Memorial. We had breakfast, lunch, dinner. Everything was paid for by this community. In six months' time, was it, Jerry, $26,400, we reached out to the community, and we were able to raise that much money. The entire trip was paid for. I got the inspiration from the honor flight, and I said, we can do one better. We can do one better, because I know the community, and I knew the Veterans Council, and I knew Jerry. Once I got Jerry on board, we did it. So again, kudos to the community. Thank you. Um, with that said, I also do want to say that uh, if anybody has not heard about it, I'm going to ask somebody to come up and talk a little bit about the many times that they go down um, with Honor Flight. And the founder of it here in New England, Honor Flight New England, is Joe Byron. And he has driven all the way down from Hooksett, New Hampshire, to be with us. And I'd ask him to just come up and talk about quickly what you've done. Well, thank you so much for having me here today and the inspiration for the New England Honor Flight. I started the New England Honor Flight in 2009, and I retired from law enforcement. In my last four years, I investigated crimes against our senior population. And in, we know in, in law enforcement that about 82% of our seniors don't report, so I walked in the mall. And I met and shook the hand of a World War II POW named Jerry Hebert, who every time he told his story, he got emotional because of the survivor's guilt. And in 2009, I got off a plane in, in Baltimore and I saw an honor flight get off and I called the national office and I said, do you have anybody in New England? And they said, well, which state do you want? I says, well, if you don't have anybody in New England, then I'll take New England. So they said, okay, do you realize now, being in law enforcement, we're not used to asking for anything. So they said, do you realize that you have to raise all your own money? And we have been truly blessed to be able to do that. We've transported 1,773 veterans down to D.C. at no cost to them. <laughs> our oldest was 101, and our youngest went into the service at 14 and a half years old. So the stories that we hear, but the one thing that we always hear from our World War II vets is... Uh, we did what we had to do. The real heroes didn't come home. So this gives them the opportunity. It's more than just a trip to D.C. They get together, and it's their time to tell the story for the first time for many of them. So it's been an absolute honor, and thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you would go ahead and ask Ed, I can pin that World War sure. II number. Ed, can you come on up? I have a World War II pin for him, and I'm hoping he might be able to come on one of our flights with us. We're going out on our 50th flight in April. <laughs> God bless you, my friend. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you so much. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, could we have another round of applause for our excellent speakers here today? Thank you, folks, all for doing this. Um, I really greatly appreciate it. The VA is still here. If you have any questions, if you want to know anything about our project to try to take care of uh, veterans in the healthcare system, Larry's right over there with Ben Clough, who's also one of the people. Also, the Vet Center is right outside. If you're in, ever interested in knowing what the Vet Center does, they're right outside. The folks are sitting here at the table. They'll show you the Vet Center. It's right out that door if you wish. Um, I think Preston wants to say something really fast. Yeah, hi, I'm Preston Hubbard. I just wanted to mention about all you've heard about all the suicides that are happening with the veterans that are coming home that have to be stopped off. And, you know, even they're not only veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, they're veterans from women's servicemen from the VA everything else and there's so many of them but I want you to always be aware 
if we as a community can do something about it, we can help, we can try to make, try to make friends, like these fellows up here said, with our neighbors. And if somebody's coming back, hey, how you doing, buddy? What's your name? What, what, what's up, you know? So we need to go out and be proactive. Thank you. Thank you, Preston. Preston is a poet. He's been published and won many awards. And we had some other writers, but I just saw them step out. We run a little long. But just thank you, everybody, so much uh, for this. And thank you, speakers, for sharing all that you've done. And uh, we will have next week, Rudy, next week, three-year anniversary. There'll be more than one veteran here, I swear. Thank you, everybody.